Let's go to our sermon time. Let's go to our preaching time. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to have you just write down three or four references. We're not going to turn to them today. But these three or four places will, together, will be the basis of what I want to talk about this morning. In uh, Matthew 22, the Sadducees come to the Lord Jesus with a question. And they ask a question about seven brothers. And uh, I presume the oldest one married a woman. And uh, then he died. And then the second brother married the widow. And he died. And all down the line, till all seven brothers had married the same woman and uh, then passed away. And now she died. And their question to the Lord Jesus was, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be? And uh, in Matthew 22, verse 29, Christ replied, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. He, in simpler words, he said, that's a stupid question. You men should know, should know better than that. Christ uh, said uh, in another verse, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. John 5, verse 39. He said, For had ye believed Moses, uh, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. John 5, verse uh, uh, 46. And uh, another place, the Bible says, Psalm 119, verse 16, I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. But by the time the Lord Jesus appeared in the world, they had forgotten his words. The scribes the religious crowd, uh, who were responsible to hand copy another uh, set of manuscripts when the previous one started to wear out. This is how they had to do it. They didn't have a copy machine. But um, they were, they were uh, very skilled. They were very uh, adept at copying the next set of scriptures to match the previous ones without any mistakes, any deviation. This was most important to them, that they were had a reputation for copying without any deviation from the previous one. And that's probably what they were the most proud of, able to do that. But they weren't reading what they were writing. That's unfortunate. How many Christians are like that today? How many people put more emphasis on the, on the cover of their Bible, whether it's got a handle, got lace, if it's a zip-up uh, leather cover, um, do they have a, a notepad shoved in there, do they have a couple of colored pens or pencils to highlight things? I see a lot of people's Bibles, they're highlighted and marked and underscored, and they couldn't quote a verse to you if their life depended on it. It's very sad indeed. I got to thinking, and I think I may have mentioned this to you a few months back, Jack Van Impey, who wasn't a perfect man, but um, in his heyday, he was a good fundamentalist, Bible uh, ba a Baptist uh, preacher, and uh, he was known as the walking Bible. And uh, I think Brother and Sister Everett were in his church years ago. The walking Bible, between 13,000 uh, 16,000 verses he had committed to memory. And he could recall each one, chapter and verse, quote them verbatim. And uh, when he passed away earlier this year, I thought, you know what? There's an, op there's an opportunity. There's an open door for somebody to become the next Jack of Impey and establish a reputation for being able to quote the verses, a uh, chapter and verse verbatim, and know where they're at. He would memorize scriptures based on um, common subject matter. So he'd memorize four or five verses all on the same subject and be able to cite off his litany of verses from that 
uh, on that subject, didn't we cover recently that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word should be established? Well, he was very uh, adept at memorizing scripture along that subject line. And uh, I would never want to take that away from him. I, you and I should wish and pray that God would make us um, hungry to know the Bible like he did. You know, modern preachers, all they can do is criticize Jack Van Impey by saying, well, all of his scriptures were from the King James Version. Yeah, well, how many do you know from any version? And the truth is probably very little. But there's an opportunity there for some Bible believer who wants to become a known as a walking Bible. That's the way to do it. But um, very few people are hungry for the Bible that way these days. <clears throat> um, God commanded Moses and the Levites to go through the, the country, through Judah, uh, teaching in the villages, teaching from town to town, teaching the people of the nation the laws of God. That's one of the first things he emphasized as he brought them into uh, Canaan after the wilderness journeys. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 19, uh, is an example of that verse. Uh, he told them to go and teach this song to the uh, people and uh, put, these, put this word in their mouth. You know, that's how an effective Sunday school teacher teaches their children. You arrange the song, arrange the verse with a melody so it's easy for the kids to learn and memorize and sing together. Um, I can think of some songs that uh, we learned as uh, little kids, teenagers, that were based on the scripture, but they had a melody so it was easy to sing them. And along the way, you're, you're memorizing them. And uh, a very clever Sunday school teacher will, will teach their children to enjoy singing about the Lord Jesus, singing the words of God that way. But, uh, you know, veggie tales and all that nonsense these days, that has nothing to do with the scripture. That has something to do with uh, cartoon uh, animators. It has nothing, very little to do with the scripture. But... Um, Christ preaching exposed the fact that the the Jews, uh, the ones who were responsible to teach the nation, hadn't been doing it. His preaching exposed that, and they didn't like it. Matthew 25, verse 18 says, when they wanted Pilate to crucify Jesus, the Bible says Pilate knew that for envy they had delivered him. They were jealous of Christ. He had multitudes following him every day. They couldn't get anyone to follow them across the street. And uh, they could see the difference. But, um, so, in Matthew 11, the uh, common people, the uneducated people, they received, they, they embraced the preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the uh, educated, the scribes, they rejected him. And the people saw the distinction. They saw the difference. Christ prayed, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, the educated, and hast revealed these things unto babes, the uneducated. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Matthew 11, verse 25. The Lord thanked the heavenly Father because he had made a common folks smart and some smart people stupid. Talk about the Lord having a, a sick sense of humor. <laughs> and yet that's, that's what it comes down to. You know, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Um, God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the things that are wise. 1 Corinthians 1 tells us. Uh, well, let me move on here. The word scholar, the word scholar does not mean an expert, a presumptive expert. The word scholar means a student. And it's given to us twice 
in the Bible, and both instances define the word as student. I'll give you those two references if you want to look it up later. First uh, Chronicles 25, verse 8. First Chronicles 25, verse 8. And Malachi 2, verse 12. Scholarship, um, or rather scholastics, has to do with your studies. And a scholarship is money paid to you to help cover the expense of your studies. It doesn't mean an expert who can lord his book learning over other people. Uh, and unfortunately, the modern world doesn't understand that. I, I've discovered, you know, a few years ago, I decided I wanted to get something that would help build up my vocabulary. I didn't like the way I sounded when I heard myself speak. And uh, so I got some materials and started listening to them. And uh, I realized how stupid most Americans are when it comes to vocabulary and word usage, uh, proper pronunciation. Now, I haven't, I haven't arrived yet, but I'm trying. I'm trying to make headway. And uh, I don't know if anyone appreciates it. I don't know if my wife appreciates it when I <laughs> throw out a, wor a new word in the, around the house. But that's okay. What does she know? Um, anyway, uh, I talked to a bank teller about three years ago uh, at the place our company does business. And I said, I've always wanted to ask you, do they send you to any kind of special class or training so you can learn better how to distinguish real dollar bills from counterfeits. She said, no, it's just experience. You get to know your own bills and you can spot a fake by the feel, by the look, there's something about it you know instinctively that's not real. And uh, she showed me some fake, uh, a fake bill that she had behind the counter, I, I, I couldn't tell the difference. But apparently she had the experience and, and I always thought that that's the way to do it. A Christian should be so familiar with his own Bible, he can tell when someone quotes something and whether it's scriptural or not scriptural. This is how he is, his spiritual instinct should be fine-tuned to know when something is not quite right, it's not been quoted correctly. And uh, so a believer should be so um, familiar with the scripture, he, he's not going to fall for a misquote or a false statement or something somebody says is in the Bible, but it, it turns out not to be. So I, I, I titled this outline today, Things That Aren't in the Bible. Things That Aren't in the Bible. Uh, I've got about 20 points, 20 examples We'll try to run through these uh, without dawdling too badly. Things that aren't in the Bible. These are ideas, phrases, expressions, beliefs that people quote, people repeat, but have no real scriptural basis at all. Uh, number one, example number one, the forbidden fruit was an apple. That should be something every Christian understands. But there are still people who say the forbidden apple in the garden. Not scriptural. Um, now, we can compare two, three, four texts from elsewhere in the Bible and conjecture what the fruit was, and I think it's pretty sound. But it wasn't an apple. It wasn't an apple at all. Um, example number two. The phrase, this too shall pass. Where did that come from? Well, those four words are found in the Word of God, but that phrase, this too shall pass, is nowhere in the Bible. You'll read, it came to pass, but this too shall pass. Not found in the Scripture. Uh, example number three today. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Well, that sounds nice. I mean, everybody likes someone else to be neat and clean. Uh, and there are a lot of rules uh, for 
washing of cups and pots and washing hands and sanitation among the Jews, especially among the priest class. But that phrase is nowhere in the Bible. Now, if a Christian parent wants to, you know, quote it, say it to their kid to get the kid to take a bath, fine, but don't tell them it's scriptural. It's not scriptural. Um, it might be good advice. I mean, in fact, I'm sure it is, but uh, it's not biblical. Example number four. Money is the root of all evil. Nope. Nope. Sorry. That's only partially right. Uh, the, the, the verse, 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, actually says, the love of money is the root of all evil. You know, it's the love of money, the desire to, to earn a, a dishonest buck, to cut corners, to get away with something that uh, you wouldn't want someone else to do, but you, you want to do it. Uh, the, the love of money, or the lust of money, uh, the idea that I'm going to enrich myself through pornography or drug trafficking or alcohol or gambling or fraud or any other kind of uh, uh, criminal uh, activity. That's, it's the love of money, the love of a dishonest dollar behind it, it that motivates people to do things. My grandfather used to, was a smoker years ago. And uh, he and my grandmother recommitted their lives to Christ 60, 65 years ago. And uh, he said his solution for smoking was simply, don't buy them, don't smoke them. And it seemed to work out. But he said, he would always say, if, if they put the same, the same restrictions on tobacco in the U.S. that they currently put on alcohol, which is not a lot. He said the crime rate in this country would go through the roof. People can't live without their tobacco, uh, never mind alcohol. And I thought, you know, you're right. You're right. People are, are hooked on their habits and the idea that you shouldn't do it or it could be denied you for some reason would just drive people into criminal conduct everywhere you go, everywhere you go. But it's the love of money that motivates people to do wrong things, wicked things, criminal things. Example number five. God works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. How many have heard that phrase? Everybody's heard that somewhere along the way. Or maybe it's the Lord works in mysterious ways, either, either version. It's not in the Word of God. The Bible says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, uh, so are my ways higher than your ways, and, your, and my thoughts than your thoughts, saith the Lord. Um, yeah, God's thoughts are much higher than ours. His desires are much greater than ours. Um, his hopes for our lives and our uh, testimonies for Him and what He might give us talent to achieve in His name are far greater than, than you and I could conceive of. But God works in mysterious ways His wonders to perform. Uh, it's not a biblical phrase. It's, it's got that kind of a lyrical flow. It sounds like it came from the Bible, but it didn't. It didn't come from the Bible. Example number six. Love the sinner, but hate the sin. Love the sinner, but hate the sin. That sounds like a good Christian charity. But it's not in the scriptures. Um, it was first coined by Mahatma Gandhi, a practicing Muslim. Love the sinner, but hate the sin. Um, it, it almost lends itself to tolerate their sin. Who wants to do that? I love the sinner, but I'm gonna, and I'm going to tolerate his sin. After a while, you, get a, you reach a breaking point. I'm not going to tolerate it. At least you should. The Bible says, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. 
thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Psalm 5, verse 5. God doesn't just hate the sin, he hates them. And uh, again, as the Lord trieth the righteous, but uh, the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. God's soul hates him. Um, Psalm 11, verse 5. Why should God love somebody who doesn't love him? Why should God tolerate someone who wants to revel in their sin and keep getting away with it and figure, uh, figures he doesn't owe anything to a holy God who gave him life and breath and a chance to live for God? Why would God put up with that? Why would you put up with it? You know, if your neighbor, and we, we've had examples in our neighborhood, maybe most of you have too, neighbors who think it's nothing to keep the party going and the music going till 3.30 in the morning, and everybody in the neighborhood is going out of their mind trying to sleep. Now, if they were playing decent music, that'd be one thing, but uh, usually it's garbage. Um, I had a guy tell me, we were talking about rap music years ago, and I had the C, the C on the front of the word is silent. So it's, it's pronounced rap, not, <laughs> not the other word. But uh, so, so we had somebody not, not long ago, just a month or so ago, kept the music going till 3.15, 3.30 in the morning, and people calling the police department, so forth. Um, why do people have to call? Why aren't people more sensible uh, and respectable uh, to their neighbors? Um, I've been fighting cancer for six years now. And uh, the neighbor lady, two doors away from us, she's fighting it as well. And the last thing I want to do is be forced awake at 3.30 in the morning because some jerk uh, is playing a lot of nonsensical noise calling it music. Well, that first of all, that shows how little music um, education uh, takes place in our public school system <laughs> um, and uh, what people's tastes are. And then we have people who start their fireworks shooting off rockets, I mean, loud things, things that aren't supposed to be uh, used, things that are in our city, a uh, thousand dollar fine every time they catch you lighting fireworks. It's against the law in a, a city with a lot of residents. And uh, we have people that start their fireworks displays, their rockets and rockets bursting in air, their M80s or their half sticks of dynamite or whatever they're lighting. They start their fireworks uh, show and around May for 4th of July. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, you get up in the middle of the night to get a drink or go, use the restroom or something. You know, at 3 in the morning, boom. <laughs> How do you go to sleep after that? But Love the sinner but hate the sin. No, no, I, I'm not going to keep loving the sinner. Um, after a while, you run out of patience. Example number seven today. Be in the world, but not of the world. It's not in the Bible. A lot of people re repeat it. A lot of people have heard it, said it, but it's not scriptural. It's loosely derived from John 15, verse 19. Let me read that text to you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Yeah, the world does hate you. We talked about this recently. I said, you can't expect to be uh, pleasing everybody. Uh, if you can love the brethren, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Um, Christ said, or uh, John, uh, Paul said, uh, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men, Romans chapter 12. Sometimes even the brethren are difficult to live with, difficult to get along with. Example number eight. 
God won't give you more than you can bear. That's commonly heard. And um, everyone should recognize the, the, the deviation that uh, comes from. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted, above that ye are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. God didn't say he's going to take the temptation away. He says he's going to help you to bear it. And uh, that's a far cry from what most people want God to do. People don't read the Bible. They don't care about God, but they want God to do what they want. When they want it, how they want it, as much as they want it, to whatever degree they want. But the phrase, God won't give you more than you can bear, is not in the Bible. Example number nine. The lion shall lay down with the lamb. Oh, that sounds so beautiful and poetic. It's not found in the word of God, however. Um, sorry, folks. The actual verse says this. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the uh, leopard shall lie down with the kid. And uh, a calf, oh, excuse me, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Isaiah 11, verse 6. When Christ sets up his thousand-year reign on planet Earth, and uh, there is perfect peace overtaking every instinct and, and nature of the animal kingdom, as well as uh, men on the Earth, there will be perfect harmony and peace in the creation. Uh, you, you hear these, some guys uh, illustrated by talking about, um, uh, I forget, uh, forgive me, I, I hadn't planned to refer to this. One verse says, um, the adder, a child shall play on the, uh, uh, pick up an adder and a cockatrice den. That's, those are poisonous serpents. And uh, those animals aren't going to bite and hurt and kill children if they go and pick up the serpent and play with them. And what a day that'll be, all right? Example number 10. God helps those who help themselves. Now that's a popular one. It seems to be almost a license for people to do what they want to do uh, and claim God's blessing on it without having any idea if God's involved at all. Uh, he's going to help them who help themselves. Help themselves to what? My car keys? Help themselves to uh, your wallet? Help themselves to any number of things. I suppose what they mean is uh, you do for yourself without expecting someone else to come along and do it for you. That might be that sound. And if you're able to do something for yourself, you ought to. Uh, I heard a, a, a Buddhist monk at a funeral, maybe 10, 12 years ago, saying the two things you should never worry about. I think I've heard Dr. Ruckman use the same illustration. Two things you should never worry about in life, the things you can change and the things you can't. If you can change your circumstances, there's no need to worry. If you can't change your circumstances, there's no point in worrying. And uh, someone gave me a third option. What if you can change something, but you're not sure if you should or not? I said, well, I didn't give that option. Don't, don't be asking new questions to me. <laughs> but those two possibilities seem to cover almost every uh, circumstance in life. Example number 11. Uh, any mention of angels with wings on their back. That's not scriptural. Angels in the scriptures do not have wings on their back. They all appear as young men, uh, and there are no wings attached to their backs or their shoulders. Angels don't have wings. Uh, angels always appear as young men uh, with no wings on them. Example number 12. Any mention of female angels or a little chubby cherub angels in a diaper. Neither of those are scriptural either. You see that depicted in an artwork. 
um, hallmarks, you know, existence depends on selling greeting cards with uh, false artwork on it. Uh, example number 13. Jesus was born on December 25th. No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. Um, that date was chosen by, from an old Roman calendar, about 300s, early 300s by one of the early popes. Let's just agree on that date because there are a lot of other uh, pagan celebrations taking place. Uh, winter solstice, the shortest day of the year, um, the re death and the rebirth of Mithras, the sun god, sun goddess. Uh, let's just mix Christ and his birth story in with those others and just celebrate them all at the same time. But uh, the idea that Christ was born on December 25th is not scriptural at all. As a matter of fact, I mentioned comparing scriptures together to arrive at the right fruit in the garden. You can do the same thing to arrive at the correct date of Christ's birth. And we're not going to go into those today. You can look on my records of sermons, Brother Gene Haw's records of sermons, and we've each covered these subjects in, in detail over the last several years. Example number 14. Any mention of halos around someone's head, someone who is especially holy or virtuous, somebody they want to uh, elevate or exalt among men, and not scriptural. Nobody in the Bible was uh, seen with halos around their head. Um, that's a reference to the sun god. That is a simply an old throwback to the idea of the sun god in Egypt and in Babylon, uh, Roman mythology, Hindu mythology, even Buddhism mythology, all of these things long before Christ. They were depicting their saintly, holy figures with halos around their head to show their, their uh, importance. But uh, it's not scriptural. It's not like, you know, what was that series? Was it Touched by an Angel? You know, Della Reese and... I forget the name of the show, you know. Where the angel shows up and she's got this glow behind her head after every episode. That's not scriptural. Halos. Example number 14. Oh, no, that was 14. Example number 15. That uh, Mary rode a donkey to Bethlehem. I mentioned this two weeks ago. Uh, when she was traveling with Joseph back to Bethlehem, uh, she was expecting, and we don't, we're, we're gracious enough to allow, she probably did ride a donkey. But the Bible never says that she did. And the two accounts of Christ's birth, Matthew 1 and Luke chapter 3, neither text says that there was a donkey involved or that she rode one. You know, I'm glad we're charitable enough and kind enough to allow that she could have ridden a donkey. But uh, nowhere in the two narratives does it say she rode a donkey or that there was one. And then to go beyond that, like the Catholic churches in medieval times did, and say, we have some of the bones from that donkey uh, in our church, and for a price you can come and see, see the bones. That's how they raised a lot of money during the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages. Say, we have this special object for a price, we'll let you come take a look at it. You'll get a blessing for having seen it, the church will benefit from it, and so forth. I always like the way TVN would say, tuck in your love gift, dear partners. Um, whatever would enrich them, their coffers, and their budget, they would make it sound as though you're the one benefiting from enriching their coffers. Um, example number 16. Uh, three wise men. Three wise men, Manny, Moe, and Jack, the Pep Boys, or Larry, Moe, and Curly. At least they were three Jews, Larry, Moe, and Curly. But uh, 
The Bible doesn't say how many wise men came. We, it's uh, decided that it should be three because there were three gifts listed. Frank gold, frankincense, and myrrh they brought. But the Bible doesn't tell us how many wise men uh, traveled to see the newborn king. Uh, example number 17, that's not in the scriptures. The wise men came to the manger in Bethlehem. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. doesn't matter what your neighbors got depicted on his front lawn at Christmas time. Uh, the wise men didn't come to the manger to Bethlehem to see the brand new babe. The shepherds did. Luke 2 says they were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. So they were close by, and the, the angel said, go to Bethlehem, you'll see something uh, take place tonight. But the wise men said, it says, they came to Jerusalem asking, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east. So the wise men came to Jerusalem inquiring of uh, <clears throat> the king, King Herod, where Christ should be born. And of course, he was in a panic, didn't know there was another king who had been born who was ready to take his place. So he set out to kill all the babies in Bethlehem, in that area, uh, from two years old and under, which indicates the age of Christ by the time the wise men showed up. He was no longer a babe in a manger. He spent one night in the manger. By the way, manger is not the structure. Manger is a feeding trough. That's what the manger was. So the idea that it's a small one about the size of a cradle was probably false too. So, um, but it looks nice on greeting cards. Example number 18. The little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. Are you kidding me? Don't, don't lie to us. The little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. What baby doesn't cry? Um, there's no suggestion that Christ was an unusual baby when he was born or that uh, he was smart enough to not disturb anybody. Uh, be quiet. You don't make a fuss. That's not scriptural. It, it sounds nice, you know, in a Christmas carol away in the manger. But um, when he was growing up, he had to bathe. He had to brush his teeth. I don't know if they brushed their teeth in those days. But uh, he had to bathe. He had to wash and clean up. He had to wash his clothes. Had to take care of himself in so many ways. Uh, otherwise, he couldn't identify with you and I. His life wouldn't have had anything common to you or to me if uh, he was a babe that never cried, never made, a, never made a fuss, never disturbed his mother, father. That's just wishful thinking by a songwriter. Um, the Bible says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin, Hebrews 4, 15. So it would be impossible for him to identify with you uh, or with me as a man walking among men if he didn't have a life very much like every other man. But uh, Hebrews 4, 15 says, yet without sin. What a marvelous thing. Yet without sin. Um... That means he experienced everything you and I experienced. Every emotion, anger, frustration, um, weakness, tired, tiredness, um, exhaustion, and uh, disappointed with people's reactions, disappointed with their answers to him, disappointed with the ignorance of the priests and the scribes who should have known the scriptures but didn't, disappointed with people who weren't, highly educated but still thought they were smart enough to reject his revelation uh, the idea that he would come into the world and not face frustration, not face difficulties is far cry from 
is a far cry from reality. And uh, example number 19, Christ entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. That's found nowhere in the Bible. Everybody thinks so. Everybody says so. And, and it may be that the previous Sunday, he did ride into Jerusalem as triumphal entry. But my point is the Bible doesn't say he did. The Bible doesn't say that he did. When um, something significant uh, would take place, the Bible was very quick to call it the first day of the week. John chapter 20. Um, they came to the tomb early on the first day of the week when they found it uh, empty and Christ had risen. But in the three references, Matthew 21, Mark 11, and Luke 19, those three references make no mention of it being on the first day of the week when he rose. And if he was crucified on uh, Tuesday uh, afternoon or Tuesday, early Tuesday evening uh, into Wednesday, crucified mostly taking it Wednesday on the cross, then uh, his his entry into Jerusalem, which if that was the 14th day of the month, which was the traditional day of, of uh, Passover, Passover was a one-day occurrence in the Old Testament, the book of Leviticus, followed by seven days of unleavened bread. But Passover was a one-day event. And if that happened on the 14th of the month, as it was supposed to do, and on the 10th day of the month, uh, they were supposed to take a lamb and examine it, make sure there were no blemishes in it, and it was suitable to be offered as a sacrifice. That means that uh, counting from, let's say, Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday, Sunday, Saturday, that uh, he couldn't have come in on Sunday, probably on Saturday. Now, someone will say, well, Saturday would be the the weekly Sabbath. Uh, it may be. But uh, you should call out the Lord Jesus showed the uh, pointed out to the disciples that uh, they'll, they'll violate one law in order to fulfill another. The Bible said to rest every seventh day on the Sabbath. And also to, sac to uh, circumcise their males on the eighth day following birth. But if the eighth day following birth happened to fall on a Sabbath day, which one were they supposed to fulfill? Were they supposed to sacrifice, uh, or were they supposed to circumcise the child uh, and violate the Sabbath day, or were they supposed to keep the Sabbath day and not circumcise the child and thus violate that? They were in a quandary. Which one uh, outweighed the other? And it might be something like that. Um, I'll confess, I, I need to study that one more. But my point is, the Bible nowhere says that Christ entered into Jerusalem on the, Sabbath, on the uh, first day of the week. It's not in the Bible. And lastly, let me finish with this. This will be difficult for you to write down. But um, none of these following words, phrases, are scriptural. They're not biblical and um, good luck trying to write any of them down. Words like Pope, Vatican, Catholic Church, the Virgin Mary, novenas, uh, lighting of candles, burning of incense, making a confession to a man, praying the rosary, wearing a scapular, sign of the cross, flying houses, we talked about that recently, relics of dead saints, transubstantiation, uh, sacraments, praying to saints, uh, Mormon undergarments, baptism for the dead, Jehovah's divine name, um, sealing marriages in a temple, uh, the restoration, uh, the, rather the restored gospel, um, gold plates in uh, upstate New York. Any of those things are not scriptural. Those were added by men centuries after the fact. 
and um, plus the ones that we listed. But it's, it's important to know what's in the Bible. Spend time reading it. If you just get in the habit of reading through your Bible from beginning to end, repeatedly. And so you're, you're never bored. You're, you're always excited to see, what will I learn today? Even though I've read that story, you know, 50 times. What new thing will jump out at me today? And I promise you, something will. Something will. Um, years ago, I've, I've told you this years ago, um, I had read through the Bible maybe six times. Um, and I was reading the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy how that uh, I've fought a good fight, I've finished the course, I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. And uh, he's trying to charge Timothy to buckle up with courage and bravery. You're going to have to take my place once I'm gone. I'm about, to, I'm about to be offered. I'm about to be sacrificed for my preaching. And um, I was sitting at my place of business early in the morning, reading, doing my morning Bible reading. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I began to weep, and cry at the table. Nobody else was around. I didn't want, I didn't want Paul to go. Suddenly, it's like the the story reached out and pulled me in, and uh, I started to cry at the table. I I didn't want him to leave, and I thought. Why am I crying now? This happened 2,000 years ago. But the Bible has a power to reach out and grab your heart, grab your soul and mind, and make you part of it. So you're no longer just a passive observer. You're now part of the story. Because you and Paul and Timothy and anyone else are all bound together in the same body of saints. You and I are bound together in the same body of saints with them. And we're looking forward to being united with them and united with one another in eternity. And what a wonderful blessing it's going to be. What a wonderful time it's going to be to, to say, I'm united perfectly with the one who loved me enough to die for me, suffered for my sake, and has promised eternal life because of my faith in Christ. Okay, let's pray, everyone, and conclude for today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this part of the Bible. I pray that it's helped somebody. And uh, I, I thank you for helping us to see things that are not scriptural, even though people say them and repeat them. We ask that you'd make us good students of the Word of God, meet the needs that each person has, home and family members, people who are ill. We pray for our church members, some who are not able to be with us. And uh, we'll thank you for this and pray it. In Jesus' name and for his wonderful sake, amen.